Okay, hi everyone, I think we should uh, get started. Um, so this is the evening session of our first day of the conference. And I wanted to remind everyone that the sessions tomorrow begin at 1 p.m. Uh, so hopefully um, we'll see all of you uh, again tomorrow. I think it'll be an exciting weekend. Um, and I think this panel will be uh, very exciting as well. So it's a, a real pleasure for me to introduce these two speakers um, who are speaking tonight, uh, Evan Calder Williams and Benjamin Noyes. Um, and for me, you know, introducing these two really encapsulates uh, what I like about doing this event in 2009 and again this year, that uh, in one case, one of the speakers, Evan Calder Williams, um, is a good friend of mine, someone who you know lives in California, uh, someone who you know conversations with him um, about politics, about philosophy, about literature uh, are very integral to my thinking in sort of an everyday way. And it's wonderful to you know be able to organize an event where I can see friends and discuss issues um, and continue those conversations. On the other hand, in the case of Benjamin Noyes, someone whose work I've been reading for a while um, and I very much admired and you know, I'm meeting for the first time. Um, and to bring those two uh, um, you know, sorts of people, let's say, together, at least in relation to me, is uh, the whole point of this sort of enterprise. Um, and I want to say that uh, I've been reading uh, books by, by both of them recently. Um, in Ben's case, uh, The Persistence of the Negative, a Critique of Contemporary Continental Theory, uh, and in Evan's case, a combined and uneven apocalypse and Luciferian uh, Marxism. And both of these books, I think, are extremely stimulating and a real inspiration um, to me and my thinking, uh, and certainly worth reading for anyone. Both books that came out in the past year. Um, so I'll turn now to uh, you know the official introductions, which will be brief. Um, so again, Benjamin Noyes, who I'm very happy to meet, is a reader in English at the Uni Re University of Chichester. Uh, he's the author, uh, first of Georges Bataille, A Critical Introduction in 2000, um, second of The Culture of Death in 2005, uh, and third, The Persistence of the Negative, A Critique of Contemporary Continental Theory in 2010. Again, a, a text which I highly recommend. Um, the second speaker this evening is Evan Calder Williams, uh, who's a PhD candidate in the Literature Department at the University of California, Santa Cruz where he's writing a dissertation on cinema and communist thought in the 1970s. Uh, Evan is the author of Combined and Uneven Apocalypse, which I just mentioned, Zero Books, 2011, uh, and also The Roman Letters, forthcoming from Oslo Edition, uh, a really beautiful book of uh, letters uh, written by Evan to friends and, and comrades from Italy last year. Um, and his work appears in Film Quarterly and Mute. Uh, his current research interests include ornament, dialectics, melodrama, and pessimism. Um, he'll be a Fulbright Fellow at the University of Naples in 2011-2012, and he writes the blog Socialism and or Barbarism. So I'd like to welcome uh, both Ben and Evan, and I'm looking forward to both of these talks tonight. Thank you, and uh, thanks for the invite, and thanks to everyone for coming. Uh, I flew in about 4 o'clock, so it's sort of a slightly weird space being in one place and then another. Um, but my talk is called The Poverty of Vitalism, and for the uh, Marxian Chiasmus, The Vitalism of Poverty, which more later. Uh, my epigraph is from William Blake's Milton. A mathematic proportion was subdued by living proportion. It appears that everywhere the philosophies of life have won out at the expense of the philosophies of the concept at least at the level of the contemporary thinking of radical politics. The calls for the vitalization of politics are deafening, as a whole range of contemporary theorizations from a heterogeneous series of sources converge on the necessity of vital politics and the presumed powers of surplus life. Affirmative biopolitics, the new vitalism, the vitalism of objects, the politics of a life, etc. The problem of life is everywhere the political problem. The neo-Nietzschean and neo-Spinozan coding of what I have called affirmationism is often propped on an affirmation of the exalted powers of life. On the one side, we have a series of signifiers oriented by the successive life, production, creativity, becoming, invention, affirmation, construction, the immeasurable. 
And the antonyms on the other side tell their own story. Death, consumption, destruction, stasis, negation. And yet the hegemony of vitalism is attested to by the fact that even these antonyms are the sites for new vitalisms. The vitalisms of contagion, viral vitalisms, the exploit, undead vitalism, dark vitalism, etc. The hegemony of vitalism is such that it seems to absorb and delimit any putative anti-vitalism. Scott Lash remarked that, quote, in vitalism, life is not at all counterposed to death. Instead, death is part of life. Our future is always inorganic matter. Death is seen as entropic and part of a recombinant life process. He goes on to state that vitalism will sit well with the idea of death, the virus, etc. No kidding. It does. Uh, nothing is so bad that it can't serve life. And so the proliferation of life, theoretically and politically, seems to know no limit. Penetrating everywhere without reserve, its fecundity giving the measure, at least for its proponents, of its necessity. Even the philosopher of the concept, Alain Badiou, has been driven to engage with the question of life and of how to live in his most recent works, Logics of Worlds and Second Manifesto for Philosophy. Of course, this is dictated by his desire to contest the ideological vitalism of democratic materialism, incarnated theoretically in the work of Tony Negri and Gilles Deleuze. But this contest takes place on the site of life. In engaging with our present moment, Badiou accepts the vitalist premise but the terrain is one of bodies and languages, if only to add and truths. But even in this addition, a certain contamination takes place, as Badiou's own conceptuality, born out of resistance to vitalism, starts to take on vitalist hues. Bodies, differentiation, incorporation and mutation display a convergence with the Baroque conceptuality of Deleuze, scaling down from the austere classicism of being event, being event into an altogether messier engagement with the vitalist thematics present. Not since the late 19th and early 20th century pairing of Nietzsche Bergson, triangulated in the political by Sorel, have we seen such a theoretical dominance of vitalism. In fact, according to Badiou in the century, we still belong to this vital century. And to adapt Wyndham Lewis's phrase, we might speak of a life cult, although Lewis himself belonged equivocally, of course, to this vitalist century. Of course, this vitalist impulse has shifted and been refigured from an early 20th century politics of will and myth, which cut its equivocal path across a range of political and artistic configurations, to today's alignment of life as surplus or excess from the biopolitical constraints or regimes of contemporary neoliberal capitalism. The philosophies of the concept, largely existing marginally to this configuration until the 1960s and 1970s, now seem more like an exceptional interlude to this persistence dominance of life. To take the measure of this entire configuration is beyond the scope of this paper, uh, let alone to provide particular and general critiques that would address all the various strands that make up contemporary neo-vitalisms, political and otherwise. Instead, here I want to take a more local reading of the terms of the vitalist and try to trace and analyse the desire that vitalism meets, especially the function of vitalism as a mythological placeholder for an absent or failed politics trace the parodic Marxian chiasmus of the poverty of vitalism and the vitalism of poverty. Uh, to pick on a singular case, and to, as usual, pick on some one, uh, a recent text by Antonia Birnbaum between sharing and antagonism, the invention of communism in the early Marx, which was published in Radical Philosophy in 2011, advocates what one might call, in an unwieldy formulation, a Bataillean vitalist communism. What is revealing in the first instance is the framing of the aporia of our current conjuncture for Marxism. Quote, the more certain diagnostic moments of Marxist theory of the contradictions of capital continue to be operative, the less politically actual they seem to become. So the more Marx is right, the less politics seem to unfold. The analytic success of Marxism is coupled to the failure of praxis, casting us into what Birnbaum calls, quote, the strange limbo of contingent temporality that leaves us searching for, quote, placeholders of communist aspirations. To flesh out this placeholder, Birnbaum tracks back to the historical genesis of Marxist communism in his early writings, which, to prefigure her conclusion, destabilized the usual coordinates of communism towards the possibilities of a generic life. 
This conclusion is predicated on a narrative that detects a tension between the class struggle theorization of communism, <clears throat> in which, quote, we set upon defeating capitalism on the basis of a movement actualizing its contradictions, which she calls the antagonism model. And then this is counterposed to the moment of a common human capacity, the sharing model, which refers to the irreducible human excess over capitalism's production of value. It is, of course, the seeming failure of the first, antagonism, that leads to the recovery of the second, sharing. This seems to me a symptomatic maneuver of contemporary vitalism. Finding the dialectic of antagonism stalled, it attempts to find another force, a non-capitalist moment, with which to recover the possibility of radical politics. Caring and sharing becomes the motif, as in, to take one example, the invisible committee's call to sharing as the foundation of the experience of communism. In Badiou's analysis, the historicist vitalism of the 20th century passion for the real forced utopia into political reality through the coordination of history and will. The Russian Revolution, as in Gramsci's phrase, the revolution against capital, would find its confirmation in historical success, retrospectively linking historical necessity to the act of will. <clears throat> in the contemporary configuration of vitalism, history is what hurts. And instead of a retroaction of will on history, we find the insistence of the introduction of contingency through the excess of life. So instead of the couplet history and will, we have the couplet contingency excess. History is inscribed in the register of defeat. Although, as in the narratives of Negri and other post-autonomous thinkers, it's possible to inscribe the defeat of communism through the real subsumption of life as a condition that opens up life as a productive and revolutionary force. Badiou remarks in a number of recent analyses that we are close to the problem of the 1840s in terms of setting the conditions for the existence of communism. Laying aside his surreptitious teleology, 1848, 1871, 1914, 1917, uh, we could say Bernbaum's archaeology of Marxist vitalism speaks to that intuition of defeat and capitalism triumphant. The impasse or the aporia of the present, the fact that uh, capitalism has failed, communism has failed, might put it briefly, propels us backwards to open the contingency of Marxist construction of communism and to dispute the inherence of communism in capital, which is obviously subject to widespread skepticism today. The path to communism, contra Brecht, is not through the bad new, but through the good old things. What emerges in that early Marx read through Bernbaum's and Bataillon reading is the emergence of a vital praxis predicated on a practice of sharing and association that emerges through the early French workers' movement. Her aim is to recover a vital Marx beneath the usual Marx of negativity and opposition. Whereas for Marx, to quote her, the proletarian is nothing, it is this nothing contracted into the fury of negation, the revelation of, revelation of sharing as excess suggests another communism. This non-negative communism, which does not lack company, as virtually all contemporary communisms are non- or anti-negative, defines itself through the rejection of negativity as the condition for the recovery of vitality. In this new old communism, quote, the communist feature does not derive from oppression. It indicates what remains in excess, an indetermination that is out of reach of negation. Communism is not predicated on capitalist negation, meeting proletarian negation of negation. It does not derive from oppression or exploitation as its condition, but instead remains in excess irreducible to negation. The alignment here, common to affirmationism, is of negativity with failure. I have spent a whole book arguing with this. <coughs> the most frivolous activities that one does. Um, the proximity of negativity to what it negates indicates its contamination and limitation. And this recalls uh, to a trope uh, that is shared amongst many contemporary theorizations. The language of excess, affirmation, and irreducible surplus are used to counter the language of the negative. Communism and Bernbaum's restatement is not a negation of oppression, but the affirmation of an untamable part of our common being. 
Negativity of the dialectic, it is implied as usual, trap and sublimate negativity within the reproduction of the present. Against this, we must have recourse to a new vitalism. <coughs> Quote to Birnbaum, what is thus heterogeneous to wage labour is also heterogeneous to negative Hegelian dialectic of labour. Vital human activity runs through indetermination, subsistence, superfluity. This is a virtually classic manoeuvre which you can retrace from Althusser to Deleuze to Negri to the point of becoming a common horizon. The alignment is of negativity with labour cast as the motor of the capitalist uh, dialectic, with the implication that negativity itself can only ever conform to labour unless it should take on an unemployed or excessive form. Against the seemingly untrammeled powers of capitalism to determine labour and life, we find it countered with an affirmation of excessive power. Vitalism. New vitalism does. Uh, within this, we can also detect a certain reluctance to engage with antagonism as the action of negativity. In Birnbaum's formulation, quote, this vital human activity does not proceed out of antagonism, nor does it derive from the sphere of work. We can see a more obvious affinity of the activity with the literary, artistic or scientific communities and the community of love than with the activity of proletarian activity. I hope I misquoted that, it's not a bad sentence. Um, in fact, we could add the correlation of vitalism with excess and with an allergic reaction to antagonism generates a politics of love that makes unlikely bedfellows, Negri and Simon Critchley, for example. <laughs> create an image that I hope is burned in everyone's minds. <coughs> so horrible. Uh, we could take up Adorno's acerbic comment that, quote, there is no lack of obliging intellectuals ready to cast suspicions upon the critical spirit of true intellectuals through an affirmation of life borrowed from what ad marriage offers. To read, there are no, no lack of obliging radical intellectuals ready to cast suspicions upon the spirit of negativity through an affirmation of life borrowed from Christian mysticism. Uh, Birnbaum herself, uh, to her credit, doesn't go this far to a simple embrace of love or art as alternative orders, but still retains the, the rejection of antagonism through this human vital activity. She argues that this point of view requires an affirmation that coincides with the incompleteness by which it maintains itself open to the contradictions of the situation it has ripped itself out of. Again, we can see that the affirmation of life, a vitalist politics, sustains itself through the protean and excessive pos possibilities of life that tear free from contradictions, i.e. the supposed marring of negativity with what it opposes, into the new space that insists on a broken dialectic of radical incompletion. It is contingency and incompleteness that are required to speak to the situation of complete determination. Central paradox. The complete determination of capitalism produces uh, a reaction of proffering radical indetermination. The alignments then of this call to life are finally remarkably simple. Life is linked to the generic, sharing, the affirmative, love, indetermination, contingency, openness, excess, etc. On the other hand, we have labour, negativity, antagonism, determination, the dialectic, and of course capitalism itself as a machine that harnesses and vampirises life. Therefore, what aligns vitalism is the affirmative, contingent and processual, even with dark or negative or epidemic vitalism, which turns to these excessive negative vitalism simply to affirm and escape from the bonds of the present. The appeal of political vitalism resides precisely in this capacity to re-energise the broken dialectic of actuality, but it does so, I would argue, at a mythological level. Inscribing an experience of life either beneath capitalism as its base matter, or somehow above capitalism as its secular transcendence, the affirmation of life is couched as contingent but omnipresent, an excess founded on an experience of loss, defeat and lack. In terms of the Marxian chiasmus, the poverty of vitalism is a mythological response that inscribes itself as a vitalism of poverty. 
This is obviously most directly true of the theorizations of Antonio Negri. It further radicalizes the reversibility of the Gambon's transformation of bare life into resource of transcendence by treating this bareness or nudity or poverty as itself an enriching power. Poverty itself is treated first by Negri in a classic Marxist fashion as, quote, the possibility of all positivity because it is lacking in all determination. And yet it functions in a mystical or Franciscan register by the creative paradox which allows this lack to signify, quote, the power of metamorphosis. Alberto Toscano, in a reflection on Negri's writings on art from the 1980s, notes his reliance on a kind of postmodern passion in an openly Christian sense. At that moment, the 1980s, replying to defeat but prefiguring his later optimism, transfiguration of the misery and suffering of capitalist experience into a higher form of life is his matrix. I would argue that such a manoeuvre from capitalist poverty to the excess of vitalist life is the common background to the political indications of vitalism. The very experiences of abandonment and destitution at the core of capitalism, inscribed within capital's own moving contradiction of the replacing of variable capital with constant capital, are taken as possible sources of hope and revitalization. Of course, such manoeuvres at first sight might be seen to be a reworking of Marx's own thematic, within the bounds of Marxism. Marx, in one of his letters to Ruger, makes a famous and still amusing comment, he will hardly suggest that my opinion of the present is too exalted, and if I do not despair about it, this is only because its desperate position fills me with hope. This hope generated by desperation, the traversal of what Brecht would call the bad new, seems predicated on the fact, fate of the proletariat as reversible. Quote, the total loss of humanity, which can therefore redeem itself only through the total redemption of humanity. What appears to have failed, though, is the imminent antagonism of that reversal. Ranciere has critiqued the reliance of this model on a presupposition of impotence and disempowerment, which also, he argues, implies a culture of distrust based on a presupposition of incompetence. In fact, what I would argue is that political vitalism reinscribes generic life, or the potential of life, as the grounding of this loss this poverty, this nothing that should be everything. In this sense, incompetence is rendered as hidden potency and disempowerment as occluded power. Such models aim to escape the negativity of abandonment and destitution, not through an antagonistic reversal through the process of struggle, a struggle which obviously doesn't seem as evident as I'm sure most of us would like, uh, but rather through the inscription of an excess in the body or more usually bodies, taken as generic and ontological grounding. In fact, what Birdman is trying to argue is that this uh, argument is already implicitly in Marx, thereby licensing the vitalist projection of life onto poverty. Of course, this is not to deny a certain vitalism that runs through and within Marx's work. As Deepesh, Deepesh Chakrabarti has noticed in terms of the very category of living labor. Again, at a certain level of gener gener generality, if one has conceded to deal with the politics of human beings rather than the seemingly more popular contemporary politics of objects, then an engagement with the living is pretty much a given. Has anyone wondered that we have to deal with the living? Uh, in that sense, anti-vitalism, as I've already noted, seems either a virtual impossibility or, and something I'm not totally averse to, uh, in danger of embracing an extreme adolescent nihilism. Or, more interestingly perhaps, a politics of anti-reproduction in terms of sex strikes from the strata to contemporary Belgium, voluntary suicide, or the negation of reproductive futurism. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn formulated the birth strike as part of a repertoire of strategies in her 1916 book, Sabotage, in the section Limiting the Oversupply of Slaves. <laughs> It's a great quote. Uh, that's probably the whole excuse for this paper, it turned out to be this quote. <clears throat> in Europe, they are carrying on this sort of limitation of product. They are saying, not only will we limit the product in the factory, but we are going to limit the supply of producers. We are going to limit the supply of workers on the market. 
men and women of the working class in France and Italy and even Germany today are saying we are not going to have 10, 12 and 14 children for the army, the navy, the factory and the mine. We are going to have fewer children, quality and not quantity, accentuated as our ideal. We can be better fed, better clothed, better equipped mentally and will, be, and will become better fighters for the social revolution. Although this is not strictly a scientific definition, I like to include this as indicative of the spirit that produces sabotage. It is certainly one of its most vital forms of class warfare that there are. To strike at the roots of the capitalist system by limiting the supply of slaves and creating individuals who will be good soldiers on their own behalf. Now, of course, as usual, uh, the perversity of capitalism is that it has done this itself. Uh, in terms of non-reproduction, capitalism itself has succeeded in driving down birth rates in its own heartlands to extreme levels. 1.2 uh, babies per women in Italy and Japan to cope with its structurally unnecessary surplus population. Capital itself depends for its own reproduction on splitting off the, the domain of reproduction. And so on the structural abandonment of the reproduction of life. And again this indicates a sort of miring of anti vitalist or more specifically anti-natalist strategies and the dynamics and trend lines of capitalism. Therefore, I'm not suggesting an escape from life per se, nor exactly a blunt dismissal of the potential of life. <clears throat> After all, in the Grindrisse, Marx's initial formulation was labour potential before becoming labour power, but rather an interrogation of the valorisation of the powers of life as substitute for actual political activity. Precisely as a placeholder for communism, by implying communism has already happened at the level of life, if only we knew it. As I've already noted, what is required is an analysis of life qua the reproduction of capitalist society itself, specific that is, to this mode of production, which may of course retrospectively throw light on the problem of life in previous social formations. In a text considering and agreeing with the thesis of him, that contemporary capitalist society is witnessing a tendency to the real subsumption of life, Stuart Martin concludes that what is required is not a valorization of life in excess of capitalism. This would be simply to ape in accelerationist fashion the trend lines of capitalism itself. Rather, he suggests that, however, if capitalism must now be approached in terms of life, a uh, life subsumed by capital, then this subverts the affirmation of life, or at least renders it inadequate. The struggle for non-capitalist life must now confront capitalist life. This, I take it, is the true, true point, especially at the point when the dream of non-capitalist life as vital as success all the more conforms to the dictates of capitalist life, which operates through the detachment of labour from the state and immediate linking to work. We might speak in the style of Audria of the mirror of vitalism, that mirrors capitalists Capitalism's own fantasy of an always excessive, always on tap, force of life underpinning its operation and from which value can always be extracted. My argument then is not remarkably sophisticated or complex, vulgar even. I bluntly suggest that the poverty of vitalism is that it operates as a philosophy of defeat, regarding itself as empowering but remaining locked into the structural place within the value form. Certainly I can't propose a solution to the failed dialectic of antagonism, but I could. And to this extent, political vitalism certainly indicates, even in the negative, correctly the problem that we face, with those of us who might want to change the conditions under which we live. However, it aligns that problem in visions of ontological power or reversible conceptions of ontological poverty, or in the powers that align with the passivity of the body overrun by forces of life or death. Precisely, that is to say, in myth. Thank you.